Welcome to the Bakersfield City Council meeting. This television broadcast is brought to you by the local cable companies, the County of Kern and the City of Bakersfield. You can watch the rebroadcast of this meeting Saturday at 7 p.m., Sunday at 10 a.m., and the following Wednesday at 7 p.m. You can download the agenda for this meeting at www.bakersfieldcity.us. Presiding over this evening's meeting, Vice Mayor Andre Gonzalez. Well, good evening. It is my pleasure to call to order the 515 regular City Council meeting of January 25th, 2023. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Mayor Go. In the absence of the mayor, the vice mayor will conduct the meeting, but will maintain his ability to vote. Vice Mayor Gonzalez. I am here. Councilmember Arias. Here. Councilmember Weir. Here. Councilmember Smith. I am here. Councilmember Freeman. Councilmember Gray. Here. Councilmember Kaur. Here. Thank you. At this time, Councilmember Smith will offer the invocation. Following the invocation, Councilmember Gray will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Will you all please rise? Father God, we thank you for this day and every day. We thank you for the opportunity to serve. We know not why you put us here, but we will do our best. We ask for your wisdom, and even more, we ask for your heart to do as you would do. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Would join me to salute the greatest flag in the world. Salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Council Member Smith and Council Member Gray. Here are a few guidelines to help our meeting run smoothly tonight. We request that you turn off your cell phones, please. And please be courteous in the use of cameras and videos. For safety reasons and as a courtesy to others, no signs are allowed in the city council chamber or lobby. Applause is allowed during the presentations portion of the meeting, but not during the other portions of the meeting. Everyone in attendance tonight is expected to adhere to the rules of decorum established by the resolution of the city council. Failure to abide by the city's rules of decorum, including any disruptive behavior that interferes with our ability to have an orderly and efficient meeting or prevents the city council from conducting the business of the city. Consider this a first warning to everyone in attendance that conduct that disrupts this meeting may result in the expulsion and or the chamber being cleared. Behavior that disrupts the meeting includes repetitive statements, going off topic, shouting, outbursts from the audience, and surpassing the two minute time limit. Madam Clerk, next item. Public statements. In keeping with the council's resolution, the public sta statement portion is now divided into two periods. There is a period for items listed on the meeting agenda and items not on the meeting agenda. Statements for items listed on tonight's agenda are given a two minute time limit, 20 minutes total per agenda item. The consent calendar as a whole constitutes one agenda item. Statements regarding items not listed on the agenda are given a two minute time limit, 20 minutes total. If you have written comments that are longer than your verbal statements, give them to the clerk who will give copies to the council. If you're here to make a public statement, please fill out a public speaker card and give your completed card to the city clerk. We ask that you mark whether you are here to speak on an item listed or on tonight's agenda or a matter not on the agenda. Speakers who do not identify a specific agenda item will be presumed speakers of the non-agenda portion. Those speakers will be called during the non-agenda portion of the meeting. If you are here on consent calendar hearing items 8A through B, now is not the time to speak. You will be given an opportunity to speak when that item is called later in the meeting. We're very interested and concerned with your 
issues. However, due to the public notice requirements of the Brown Act, the council can't take action when an item isn't on the agenda. The council can, however, refer your matter to committee or request that staff contact you. Madam Clerk, do we have any public speakers regarding items listed on tonight's agenda? Vice Mayor Gonzalez, we have one speaker for items listed on tonight's agenda. And the first speaker is Brooks Douglas. Thank you, Mr. Douglas. Thank you for uh, having me up here. I really appreciate it. Uh, my name is Brooks Douglas. I am chairman of the Keep Bakersfield Beautiful Committee and uh, represent our uh, wonderful uh, councilman, Bob Smith. Uh, just to let you know, uh, this, is a, this is a positive thing <laughs> that I'm talking about here today. Uh, we have some vacancies that are coming up um, in Ward 1, 2, and 3. Uh, so I wanted to make sure that we make sure that we have the appointees done that we can get done today because we have the Great American Cleanup coming up very shortly in, uh, in April. And we want to make sure we have a full squad for that. So we have Teresa Olson as well as Ray Scott. Both have been on the board before. Their terms uh, have expired and hopefully will be reappoint, reappointed today in one of the awards, whether it's Ward 3, Ward 2, or Ward 1. So I just wanted to uh, pitch that they are uh, have know the system. They're very great volunteers. As you know, great volunteers are really tough to, to keep. It's always great to find them as well. So I uh, thank you guys very much and hope that uh, if they do not make it on the agenda or on the appointment today, that they uh, be put on the appointment for uh, the, on the agenda for the next uh, meeting in two weeks. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Douglas. Uh, Madam Clerk, do we have any public speakers regarding items not listed on tonight's agenda? Vice Mayor, we have four public speakers regarding items not listed on tonight's agenda. The first public speaker is Juan Salazar. Mr. Salazar. Uh, good evening, my name is Juan Salazar and I'm a construction inspector with the city of Bakersfield, development sector of public works and also a member of SEIU Local 521. Today I want to enter into public record over 500 signatures from my coworkers and myself, demanding a fair contract with the city of Bakersfield. My coworkers and I are the backbone of our local economy. We not only keep our parks and roads clean, safe, and accessible, we also help commercial and small businesses connect with resources and tools to thrive and keep growing their businesses. Unfortunately, throughout this time, our working conditions have impacted the amount of workers who wish to stay working for the city. Throughout these years, this city has grown and continues to grow to the betterment of every one of its citizens, but yet not enough coworkers can justify staying at these jobs due to the level of compensation and benefits, which have remained stagnant and when coworker rights are stronger elsewhere. Each and every one of my colleagues are hardworking, industrious people that have endured through being overworked and underpaid throughout this time. We have been unable to acquire strong and talented individuals for the same reason in that we cannot provide them with competitive wages and benefits to perform the duties that have been asked of them, which in turn duty has left an incredible strain towards those of us that further perform our duties to the best of our abilities. We feel and know we have earned through our years of service and hard work the opportunity to better provide for our families and at the same time, give the absolute best to this great city we call home. In conclusion, we stand with one another tonight in asking this council to ensure our abilities in providing continued quality service and hard work, as well as the pride it takes to further move forward in growth and strength. I ask this council to improve retention and recruitment of city workers by improving working conditions and wages. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Salazar. Madam Clerk, next speaker. Richard Rodriguez. Mr. Rodriguez.
Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you for allowing me to address the council this evening uh, regarding uh, backyard poultry. Uh, while my wife's health is my biggest worry about possible exposure, again, to backyard chickens, I would like to speak about another issue that hits uh, very close to home. Uh, I understand you have detailed information from the Centers for Disease Control regarding the health hazards introduced by backyard poultry from this issue last time it was decided to not allow backyard poultry. Um, I'm giving the, the council current information from the CDC released just a few months ago, again, identifying elementary young children and older adults such as myself as being most at risk. And once again, backyard poultry is the number one identified cause of animal to people transmission uh, disease in the US. And once again, California is the worst state in the country. I also think it's very important in the information that I left that you notice that the Right at the top, the, the CDC states, the true number of sick people in these outbreaks is likely much higher than the number reported because many people recover without medical care and are not tested. As a lifelong public school educator, I spent 37 years at the Bakersfield City School District at the junior high school, middle school level, um, teaching students uh, population identified as disadvantaged. Poor health outcomes have been a specific target for strategies to correct the historical poor health burdens endured by young school-aged children. And so my question is how will introducing known disease risks by the CDC that they so clearly identify be promoting educational quality and equity uh, to these children? And we want students to come to school and to stay in school. I'm not a medical doctor, and nor is my neighbor, Mr. Merkel, who spoke a few weeks ago, and still has a couple of chicken coops sitting against our fence about 40 feet from our back, a bedroom backyard door. But our daughter is a medical doctor, and I'm sure her advice to you would be to listen to the experts, give meaning to the full name of the agency, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rodriguez. Madam Clerk, next speaker. Lance Powell. Mr. Powell. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for allowing me to speak today. My name is Lance Powell, and I'm currently in my 27th year as a city of Bakersfield Police Dispatcher for Emergencies. I'm also an SEIU member and a registered voter. I want to address our current recruitment and retention crisis. I'll just give you the bottom line. Uh, we're in need of qualified applicants to join our ranks to keep our city safe, to keep your city safe. Uh, we're no longer able to entice new applicants nor retain the fully trained dispatchers that we're used to. Um, our own human resources department completed an internal salary review and initial market survey results reported 44.07 below market comparison for police dispatcher one. And even locally, 13.05% below the least, uh, most recently adopted Kern County rate for dispatchers. Uh, but let me be clear, you know, we are the first responders, okay? We're the very first responders. And yet none of the dollars that measure in have benefited us. Uh, before an officer or a paramedic arrives, we are the ones who respond to your 911 call, your pleas for help, your family's call for assistance. We decide who to send, how many, how fast they go, and what they're expected when they're, what they're ex to expect, should I say when they arrive. It takes a full team to do this effectively and we're currently losing an average of eight to 10 dispatchers over a year's period. Um, also, recruitment continues to dwindle all at the same time. So they're leaving for higher paying jobs with little to no stress and in some cases, a lot of cases, they're leaving for lower paying jobs because to them, the small amount that we're paid isn't worth the stress. So those of us who are still here are constantly asked to stay over, come in early, work days off, work holidays, et cetera. And all of this is an attempt to keep the minimum staffing that the state requires in the room. Along with our city coworkers, PSTs, parks, sanitations, park and recs, and everyone else, we're just asking for a fair union contract. So I ask that this council to improve retention and reten uh, recruitment for city employees and city workers by improving working conditions and wages. Thank you, that's it. Thank you, Mr. Powell. <laughs> Madam Clerk. <laughs> Madam Clerk, next speaker, please. Rob Ducal.
Should I wait for? Thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, Vice Mayor Gonzalez, City Council members. Uh, my name is Rob Duco, and I'm the Public Affairs Manager for Southern California Gas Company here in Kern County. I'm here tonight to talk about something that I uh, emailed all of you about a couple weeks ago, and that is the uh, historically high price of uh, natural gas, which your constituents and our customers are seeing this month. Um, prices are, uh, customers will see bills in January that are double or more than they were a year ago for the same period. Uh, this is because of uh, the spike in the price of the commodity of natural gas, which is something that is beyond our control and something that we do not mark up. When we buy gas, we sell it to our customers at the, at the price uh, we pay for it. According to the U.S. Energy Information Administration, there's a number of reasons for this price hike. Widespread below normal temperatures over the last few months along the entire West Coast from the Canadian border to the Mexican border. Uh, as a result, there's been higher than usual demand for natural gas for heating purposes. Um, re there was a reduced supplies of natural gas in storage at the beginning of the heating season. There's reduced supplies coming from the Northern Rockies and Canada uh, during uh, this year. And there's reduced interstate pipeline capacity from West Texas uh, because of pipeline maintenance going on there. All of this has resulted in the increase in prices. There are some, several things customers can do and your constituents can do to help lower their energy costs. They can reduce the, their thermostat by three to five degrees if their health permits. Installing uh, caulking and weather stripping around doors and windows can reduce the energy costs. Washing clothes in cold water can help. Reducing the temperature on a hot water heater can help. And limiting the use of non-essential appliances such as pool heaters, spas, and fireplaces can also help. We also this year donated $1 million to the Gas Assistance Fund, which offers assistance to customers to pay their gas bills. More information on all this um, is on our website at SoCalGas.com. It was included in the emails I sent you. I'd be happy to resend any information any of you wish and answer any questions now or at an appropriate time if you wish me to. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Dicko. Madam Clerk, next item. Appointments item 6A, appointment of three members to the Keep Bakersfield Beautiful Committee due to term expirations of regular member Ray Scott, Ward 3, and alternate members Anna Smith, Ward 1, and Jennifer Van Elstein, Ward 3. Applications for appointment have been received from Teresa Olson, Ray Scott, J.P. Masuda, Rafael Molina, Joshua Yurkanen, Thank you, Madam Clerk. These appointments are by ward, therefore no ballots are required. I will call on Council Member Arias for Ward 1 nomination of the alternate committee member and Council Member Weir for Ward 3 nomination of the regular and alternate committee members. Council Member Arias. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Um, unfortunately, none of the current applicants uh, reside in Ward 1. Uh, so, so we will continue to do some engagement and outreach to members in, in the ward and uh, come back at the next meeting with the recommendation. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Weir. 
Thank you. I would like to nominate Ray Scott as the regular member and Teresa Edmondson Olson as the alternate. Council members, if you have a motion, please cast your vote. Motion is approved with Council Member Freeman absent. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Next item, please. Consent calendar items 7A through 7W for approval. Staff memorandums have been provided for uh, the following items. 7G, indicating that the agreement was approved by the BCSD board. 7F, pulling the item from the agenda this evening. 7M, transmitting a signed agreement. Council Member Weir. Thank you, was it my understanding that, count, that item S has been polled? Item F as in Frank. Frank, okay. Okay, with that, uh, Council Member Gray has polled item W and U. With that, I will make a motion to approve items 7A through 7W with the exception of F, W, and U. Council members, you have a motion. Please cast your vote. Motion is approved with Council Member Freeman absent. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Now to item W. Council Member Gray. <laughs> Thank you. Um, first of all, um, I want to, I don't want to have any misunderstanding by me polling this to where I people feel that I am against um, improving MLK. I know two, year, two weeks ago, there was a huge presentation. Unfortunately, I was a, unable to attend. But speaking with some of my other colleagues, I felt that um, I would have to, buy, to vote no on this additional funding for this plan because I feel like we are getting ahead of ourselves on this a bit premature. When this idea came back um, to revision MLK Park uh, by our colleague Bruce Freeman, he brought the plan forward so that we could begin to look at redeveloping the area around the park as well as the park. Um, we feel that it's prudent to do, I'll put it in simple terms, if somebody comes into my business and they wanna do a countertop only, we say, wait a minute, let's look at the whole kitchen before you end up spending money that maybe you might have to spend again. So I think as a council, we need to be very um, careful about how we're spending this money up front um, with maybe promises being made prematurely when we don't even know what the big picture is. So I feel that it, right now, another $230,000 spent on, quote, more um, plans, conceptual plans, that's a lot of money to be throwing out there when we don't have the big picture in place um, for the, the entire area out there. I think we need to be thinking about improving the lifestyle around MLK Park with better retail and so forth than just jumping in and spending $80 million on a park and a building. Um, and from what I understand, 60, a mil 60 million of that would be on the building only. So um, I would have to vote no on additional monies towards conceptual plans until we have a more of a master plan of redevelopment in place so that we can really improve the lifestyle of the area not just the park. Thank you, Council Member Gray. Uh, Council Member Audius. Thank you, Vice Mayor. <clears throat> um, I'll, I'll start by saying that, you know, th this process to get MLK reimagined and uh, 
a new a new plan with a new vision uh, for, for that community and for that park specifically, including the community center. I've really appreciated every single council member, with the exception of uh, the new council member uh, from Ward 7, um, appreciating, uh, I've appreciated, you know, the support every step of the way. Um, and, I, and I value the input from every one of my colleagues. Um, and I frankly agree. I think we need a strategic plan that is inclusive, not just of the community center, not just of the park, uh, but it's, it's much broader in scope. How do we change and transform and uplift uh, the lives of residents who have lived there for so long? Um, which is something that Bruce has certainly uh, mentioned uh, every time that this has come up. Come up. I think um, uh, Vice Mayor Gonzalez has also echoed uh, similar sentiments. I know I've said it many times, and, and I think the time is now. Um, and I would like to ask, actually, uh, City Manager Clegg, how can we develop that strategy? Do we need to go back to the uh, contract that we've developed with the existing contractor and expand the scope of their work to make sure that it is encompassing not just of the park itself, but the broader community? Thank you, Council Member, um, and through Vice Mayor and, and to the Council. Uh, I, I don't uh, recommend amending the park's master plan for this neighborhood assessment, but here's the reasons why. Uh, we've actually leveraged the park's master plan update already by adding some specific elements to look at um, Kaiser Permanente Sports Village, to look at the Kern River Parkway area, to look at McAllister Ranch um, future potential recreation uses, as well as this MLK um, um, park and facility specifically that's close to the scope of the park's master plan. It's within the purview of um, what that team is already working on and, and their expertise. I think once we start looking at the neighborhood impact, it's a little bit broader than the park's master plan. And actually, because of Councilmember Freeman's interest in this area, we've already been looking at some options for how we could um, get this done. Um, uh, you'll recall that the council approved a vendor pool of uh, potential um, uh, professional services vendors that are uh, really uh, available uh, to acquire services for um, uh, outside of uh, sometimes the more lengthy full RFP processes. And we've actually already looked at some firms that are on that pre-approved list by council that could do some um, land use based planning efforts around not just MLK, but our, uh, some of our other focused neighborhoods. And we actually have a Brownfields um, grant that the city has received uh, and it is eligible to do some of that neighborhood level planning. And so we're looking at the downtown core, we're looking at um, the prosperity neighborhoods of MLK and Monterey Niles and potentially also Union Avenue, even though it's a little bit outside our prosperity neighborhood. It's an area that's, that's had some brownfields opportunities, so it's eligible under this grant. So our recommendation as staff, and we're gonna be bringing this forward soon, is to actually use that brownfields money to conduct some planning exercises. And it's, it's to, to be clear, and I'll try not to be too um, lengthy on this response, but it's not creating a like a general plan document, a specific uh, element of that neighborhood, but it's m also more than just having zoning on the map. It's actually taking a look at the neighborhood scale and making some recommendations and visualizing that in some pictures for the neighborhood and for council to see what could it look like? Because often I think once you see that on paper, on an image, you can say, well, that's what we like that neighborhood to look like or maybe something a little bit different. So long answer, short, I, uh, we have uh, another approach that we think can get at that master planning of an area um, that's at a level above your just typical you know, zoning, um, but uh, also doesn't get afoul of where our, our, our general plan needs to say about you know um, specific um, uh, you know, mun municipal code sections uh, uh, for areas of the city, and so I would recommend that we follow through on that. And um, you know, at, at the discretion of council, we can prioritize some areas, even within those four that I mentioned, uh, like MLK, to make sure that we're well aligned with the revitalization efforts um, uh, uh, that the park footprint itself 
can be used to leverage for the broader neighborhood improvements. Excellent. Thank, thank you for that response. I think um, uh, that concern is one that we've heard many times. Uh, we must take into consideration, you know, not just the park, the community center, but also, you know, the school just south of, of the park. Uh, how do we take care of some of the street racing that occurs on um, all sides of the park? And um, quite frankly, the public safety issue. Um, so I think that that's something that we're closely taking a look at. Um, appreciate working with Vice Mayor Gonzalez, my colleague, uh, to make sure that we're doing a thorough and comprehensive look at, at this project. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Adias. Uh, Councilman Weir. Thank you. Um, you know, I'm, I'm positive that everybody on this dais wants to see changes and improvements at, at MLK, MLK Park. But it, it, we spent almost a million dollars on this now, and we're asking for $229,000. I mean, what, what does that do for us? I mean, where is where's that taking us? Great question, Council Member, and I'll ask Rick Anthony to, to supplement my answer. But essentially, uh, at the last update to Council, when we had the workshop on the MLK Park plan, we walked away from that meeting with some feedback uh, from Council about some things they still wanted to see to help us. And I think, re respectfully to Council Member Gray's uh, concern, is what really is the master plan for that area? This dollars is enough of a change order to help us finalize that uh, initial step to get that plan in place before we go and start doing design of what the actual building and park will look like. Rick? Yeah, good evening for the record. Rick Anthony, Director of Recreation and Parks. Uh, when we did bring MIG here in November, it was a conceptual that had been worked on by quite a bit of uh, community engagement, both by the committee and the general community at large. And at that time, we were bringing to council sort of three concepts, uh, knowing that we needed to make some decisions to move into design. So the concept that was unanimously chosen by the council is now being uh, progressing through as going into design. This first phase of design is almost like a specific concept because they do not know the site limitations on the property, they really want to look into our programming needs both now and the future, and that will determine the exact design cost. So this is actually part of the bigger design, which is going to probably take over a year. So this is the initial step. They'll come back to us now with more accurate figures to say, this is the, the, the facility that can fit on this space. These are your program demands. This is the cost. The design is part. At that point, we'll be able to make a better educated decision on the size, the scope, and the cost. So that's merely what's in front of you today, is to keep the ball rolling, because we all know this is maybe even a two-year project by the time everything is done. So, so this continues on for, uh, for a year? The design is, when you talk about environmental reviews and, and construction documents, it does take quite a bit. This, First process is about three to four months, and then that will determine more specifically in terms of, we, the concept is literally what is the wish list on a kind of a board. They have to do a deeper dive now and talk about what our constraints are to the site, what are the true program needs, what that additional cost, even the fact that we've included the possibility of administrative offices there, those are all things that they have to hash out, and that's what represents here today is that effort so they can say, based on all that information, this is what we're looking at in terms of what, this, what the uh, park renovation will look like and what the design was also mm -hmm. actually going to cost us. Okay, and I don't want to put this out of context, but it sounds like what you're telling me is a lot more than 200000 bucks. Eventually, yes. So is 200,000 bucks going to get you where you need to go? 200,000 bucks will get us through this initial conceptual phase, which will produce design documents to know what we're building, how much it's going to cost, how much it's going to cost to design it, get through the environmental reviews and the construction documents. 
Sounds like a bargain. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Council Member Weir. Councilman Smith. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Uh, I, I agree that we need to look at the whole area and obviously we want to do everything we can to redevelop the whole area in the best method, but I, I don't see a conflict with going forward with the park design because everything else gets built around the park and is designed and the redevelopment happens because of the park. And so to me, it makes a lot of sense to move forward, keep the ball rolling, yeah. and get a better, clearer picture of what the community center, the park, those facilities look like, and then it follows more naturally to look at the land use and the redevelopment around the area. So I'm forward going forward at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Smith. Um, I did want to make a comment myself and just put things into context here. We're talking about an investment in a park in a historically disadvantaged neighborhood, historically disinvested neighborhood. The very reason why we all recognize the need for redevelopment is because of that disinvestment for decades. And it's my opinion that this investment is not only not only a good idea, but it is required. If we are gonna meet our goals as a city to revitalize every single part of the neighborhood, or of the city, if we're going to talk about quality of life, we should talk about quality of life for every single part of the city. If we're talking about revitalization or um, you know, economic development, this becomes a catalyst. I'm not a developer, but I talk to a lot of developers and they talk a lot about anchors. And uh, this becomes an anchor. This becomes a place that draws in people. And if we have enough imagination and enough vision, we can actually create an amenity that can draw people in from beyond the neighborhood. And I think we've all visited the MLK Center. I think we all recognize, at least I hope that we all recognize, that it's, it, is, it is in major disrepair. And quite frankly, it's a bit embarrassing at this point. And so I'm eagerly awaiting the day where we demolish that building and we build something that we can all be proud of for the whole city, that we can place in any neighborhood, whether it be the Southwest, the Northwest, the Northeast, downtown, and it would be something that we can all be proud of, something that inspires the community, something that motivates the community. And I think Bakersfield needs more amenities, more public facilities that inspire our, all of us in this community. So that's why I'm so excited about this project. I wanna thank Councilmember Audius for uh, pushing this on and, um, and then handing, handing me the baton to uh, carry the water on this now that it's in War II but I'm gonna to continue to push hard for, for this uh, project. And with that, I'm gonna make the motion tonight. Uh, we have another speaker, uh, Council Member Kaur. I just wanted to echo a lot of the comments shared by um, my colleagues. Uh, and I wanna thank uh, Rec and Parks and Rick Anthony and all the leadership. Um, though my term so far has been short in the learning process, I can say that I've attended a few now community gatherings in which folks have shared their input and are giving feedback. And I'm very impressed with how much community has been involved in this process. And I know folks are proud to be included in this process. And I think that in itself sets a precedent in when we improve um, our minoritized and marginalized areas of the city, how do we set a precedent that includes the community but in a way that makes them proud and heard? And um, just this week, uh, I was able to attend an event, the Blue Zones um, Project, and folks at my table were actually very proud of being a part of the process in, in, in helping revitalize this area. And again, I think it would set a precedent into what beautiful parks and infrastructure can look like. And so um, I just wanted to thank everyone who's done the work before me and, um, and, and echo the, the great work being done there. There are no additional speakers. Uh, you have a motion. Uh, council members, please cast your votes.
motion is approved with council member freeman absent and council member gray voting no thank you madam clerk next item is seven you council member gray this is um, based on the additional um, security that we're going to be putting in different areas of the city which i'm very much for um, 1.1 million dollars with city guard but I'm interested in what areas exactly that this is going to be covering because that wasn't clear in the report. Thank you, Council Member Gray, and uh, through Vice Mayor and to the Council, um, that's a great question. This is going to supplement uh, the team that we had talked about it on the October 19th presentation to the Council that the Police Department is creating a team that's going to focus on commercial crimes and commercial areas. There's actually two aspects to that. One is sort of organized retail crime where folks are targeting you know, retails for theft, but also it is a lower level vagrancy vandalism um, in our commercial areas that's also plaguing our, our local businesses. And so uh, these security patrols, because we already have some private security that um, has uh, was initially focused on downtown. We expanded that beyond downtown and the police department uses uh, another security contract to target some of our hot spot areas. This expansion uh, is going to provide additional uh, resources to be a force multiplier for police so they don't have to be everywhere at all times but have a lot more um, eyes and ears in all of our commercial districts. Uh, it is important to note that this is not uh, intended to be leveraged as much in our residential areas. It really is focused on our commercial corridors. Uh, we're going to follow data um, on this to uh, deploy them. Um, it is envisioned to cover commercial areas citywide, but we're going to look at some of the calls for service and some of the um, um, crime reporting statistics to help us prioritize where we have the biggest issues, but it will be flexible. They'll be able to make adjustments along the way. And, and it was uh, envisioned to make sure that it included a variety of types of security. So it could include bike patrols, walking patrols, in addition to vehicles and driving patrols based on the needs that are being experienced in our commercial areas. So that, that is the focus. Uh, the, the police department's creating a unit which uh, will have some detectives and officers that are gonna be doing direct follow-ups and responses with these commercial areas as well. But this, these security teams are gonna, uh, again, be their multiplier to be in more places. Good, thank you very much. I'll make a motion to approve um, you, seven you. Council members, you have a motion. Please cast your vote. The motion is approved with council member Freeman absent. Thank you, Madam Clerk, next item. Consent calendar public hearings item 8A through 8B for approval. A staff memorandum has been provided regarding item uh, 8B, transmitting the signed agreement and correcting a Scrivener's error. Thank you. It is now time for the consent calendar hearings. The purpose of this section is to vote on all of the items listed under consent calendar hearings in one motion without further comment. If anyone would like to speak on any of the hearings, uh, hearing items listed, the item must be removed from this portion of the agenda. If an item is removed, it will be placed at the end of the regular public hearings portion of the meeting. At this time, I'll open consent calendar public hearing items 8A through B. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to request that a hearing item be removed from the consent calendar? Seeing none. Does any council member wish to remove any item from the consent calendar hearings? Seeing none, at this time, consent calendar public hearings items 8A through B is now closed. Council Member Weir. I move approval of item 8A and 8B. Council members, you have a motion. Please cast your vote.
Motion is approved with Councilmember Freeman absent. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Next item. Council, uh, I apologize, reports item 10A, recommendations for city charter review. Thank you, City Manager Clegg. Thank you, Vice Mayor. I'll just give a moment for the slide presentation to come up. As that's coming up, uh, just as a context setting, uh, this item um, is in response to a referral from City Council to um, look at an independent review of the City Charter as well as um, recommendations from staff about uh, charter uh, review and, <clears throat> and the timeline and format in which um, uh, that could take place. Thank you. To again set a, a additional context, just want to you know from uh, the standpoint of city staff, what are the objectives behind taking a look at the charter? Um, some might say, if there's not an issue, um, do, do we need a, a fix? And so uh, the objectives are um, to look at ways to s simplify, clarify, streamline adopt best practices, and in particular, identify are there areas of risk or opportunity or concern that, that do merit some consideration. Uh, I uh, understand also that there's some interest in uh, some specific uh, sections for review, and um, there are some areas where staff have identified uh, some sections that could use some of that clarity or modernization that um, can simplify some of our processes. But as a first step, as recommended um, and, uh, in referral, is to explore an independent review. So we have an opportunity because the city has hired a performance audit firm, Moss Adams, and they're conducting a number of performance audits on an annual basis, much like an, you know, a controller or auditor would uh, if we had that specific function. Uh, we reached out to Moss Adams to determine their availability and their expertise in being able to conduct an independent review. Moss Adams has conducted multiple charter reviews for other cities. This is within the scope of their contract um, and within the scope of their expertise. The good news is Moss Adams has reported that they can begin work on this immediately and the, in the next two months that they can complete an independent review uh, of our city charter. In discussion with Moss Adams, their recommendation is um, to uh, do an overall scan of the city charter just from a risk basis to determine if there are opportunities uh, for improvement or areas of concern. And then based on uh, some, again, the sections I mentioned before of interest, um, that we would recommend that they that their scan includes specifically a look at Article 3 and Article 4 uh, to determine if there are any recommended uh, sections for update there. I would note um, as well, uh, Moss Adams recommended to us that um, the approach be taken from looking for best practices, you know, and they, they can do comparisons uh, with uh, other municipalities that have um, you know, updated their charters um, and will have some recommendations for us just on even the approach, what are best practice recommendations in the approach to conducting a uh, charter uh, update. Uh, f from the timeline perspective, as I noted, that they can get at this in the next two months. We could come back to the city council in April with that analysis. And then based on that report, determine are there certain amendments that the city does want to pursue? And there's a couple different paths that actually can be taken. If there are some, what you might call more simple cleanups, you could ask city staff or Moss Adams to just draft um, proposed language for those more simple cleanups or streamlinings or, or clarifications. Um, to be brought back to the City Council. If there are topics that the City Council determines they want a Charter Review Commission to take a look at, um, to dig into um, perhaps a more lengthy or challenging topic, that is another potential pathway. From the timeline perspective of getting recommended charter uh, language back to the City Council, it needs to happen by the end of 2023 because you'll need a few months in early 2024 to make those determinations about accepting those recommendations or further revising the language, um, because as this slide shows, 
in order to get it on to a ballot for the general election in fall of 2024, you need to be done at the council level really by May so that it can be on your agenda in June and uh, to the county by August to be on um, the ballot in, in the fall. And it is worth noting too that if th um, this analysis identifies some larger topics that are gonna take additional time, some topics could be phased to be addressed in 2026. But as a reminder, um, in California now, um, ba uh, charter uh, ballot amendments have to occur in a general election cycle. Oops, I went too fast. Uh, also, uh, good news on the independent review is that we had set aside budget for Moss Adams to conduct a number of um, uh, projects in the budget and there is still capacity within that annual allocation. And so it would be a $40,000 cost to have them do that work over a two month period. But we have that money currently in the budget. As a reminder, just looking forward, if we do put measures on the ballot, a minimum $100,000 cost uh, per ballot measure. Um, and um, if we have you know, a number of uh, measures um, that, that does multiply. And, and I would just also note um, for the benefit of the council, you know, as uh, this analysis comes back and we start to dig into the work, of course, there are also just the costs to staff time and effort. Um, and if uh, we pursue, uh, for example, a, a charter commission in, in the future, noting the other committee assignments that we have, um, that is a, like another Brown Act committee body that would require some staff support and, and we'd need to think about prioritization of their work um, alongside with the other um, uh, committees and, and work of the council. So with that, uh, my recommendation to the council is for us to move forward with what would be a contract change order with Moss Adams to add this $40,000. Again, it's within the scope of their contract. We don't need a new contract. We would just add dollars to it. Um, and pursue that as quickly as possible over the next couple months to come back in April with a uh, analysis and then we can make recommendations for how to move forward. Thank you, City Manager Clegg. Council members. I, I guess I'll just ask a couple questions. Um, so in the analysis, I assume that there's a comparative analysis with other, with other cities and how particularly the legislative function um, uh, how, how it's made up um, and uh, kind of gives us that framework uh, so that we can determine where we stand as a city. Yeah, thank you, Vice Mayor. The, the specifics of a scope that Moss Adams has provided us with a proposed scope that we would, again, bring for council approval, but um, in review of that scope, they recommend taking four to six benchmark cities and taking a really hard look at comparisons um, to, to find cities that look most like us um, and um, that that would uh, follow through with their comparisons, you know, in some of their best practice recommendations, not only in structure, but some of the other reviews of charter sections, they'll look at those other cities that have a similar structure to Bakersfield. Mm -hmm. And in your experience um, in, in other cities, uh, when this topic is brought up, is an independent review commission um, typically uh, formed? Uh, I, I would say the, the normal practice is yes, to have a commission formed. Um, th there's a variety of ways to get at this. Um, some cities choose to just develop the draft language as a city council and just or address it as a city council. Um, some um, we'll have an independent review, although that's actually a little more unique. I, I like that approach. It gives us some good analysis, but um, it's not as common, although it does happen. Um, but a majority of uh, municipalities that take on a charter review do form an independent commission. There are also different ways to do that. Some have a standing commission. Um, the vast majority form a time-limited commission. And my recommendation to council, if you go in that direction, is by resolution to establish a very specific timeline and a very limited scope directing the commission to only look at those sections that the council is interested in them reviewing. So let, let's play out the timeline here. So if we wait until April to determine if we want an independent commission, um, thereafter then we would have to adopt a resolution uh, and then we would have to seat 
members of the community on that commission and have a process through which people can apply. Um, so I'm imagining that takes a few, several, several weeks, if not a few months. Um, and so now we're talking about maybe June, July. Can we accomplish uh, this task before January 2024? Uh, Vice Mayor, I, I think uh, the, the answer is yes, but let me give context to it. Uh, it. It depends on the scope that you give to a charter commission. If you're going to give them six or seven meaty topics to take up, then no, you can't make it by January. If we get through that independent analysis and you want to hand them maybe two or three meaty topics, then it is more likely. Um, also. Um, it's, it's hard to say before we've completed the analysis, but I, I would say it's probably a, a two-month process to get a resolution fully established and a group fully seated. We can do some things in parallel, but it probably is about a two-month process. If council wants to provide staff direction to do some of that legwork between now and April, we can do that in parallel, at least um, establishing the parameters and the guidelines that we would recommend so that council can move more quickly after the independent analysis in that formation and not, you know, um, wait uh, all that, you know, a, a full two months to have a group seated. Um, I think we could work some of that in advance, but, you know, it, it's, it's with the assumption that of the likelihood that we would move forward with a charter commission uh, that that work, you know, uh, would be beneficial or not. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councilman Smith. Thank you, Vice Mayor. I'm, I'm thinking that the first recommendations that wouldn't need to go to a commission would be easy to get on the ballot for 24. And perhaps the meatier ones that the community needs to discuss at large through a commission stuff would make sense to address that later in 26. Um, it seems like, you know, there's been talk ever since I've been on about the charter and, and there, you know, there's lots of cleanup stuff, lots of simple stuff and to get that out of the way and, and get that done would make sense to me. Uh, and then the things the community really needs to discuss would take longer. But I'm in favor of going forward from this point where we're at. Thank you. Any other council members would like to speak? Council Member Weir. make a motion that we move forward with the analysis from Moss Adams and see where that takes us. Thank you, Council Member Weir. Uh, Council Members, you have a motion. Please cast your vote. Motion is approved with Council Member Freeman absent. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Next item. Council and Mayor statements. Are there any council members who would like to make statements tonight? Councilman Smith. Thank you, Vice Mayor. I just wanted to comment on the Blue Zones project. Uh, their discovery report, which they submitted yesterday regarding uh, promoting natural movement and, you know, the health and safety of the community. As I've mentioned before, we've doubled our fatal collisions. Uh, 2018 was 27, and we're pushing 60 last year, fatal traffic collisions, and, and we've formed the ad hoc committee on 
multimodal transportation and traffic safety and we've already made some of the recommendations that they talked about uh, reducing street travel lane with and uh, design treatments for walkers and bicyclists but I just I would like for the ad hoc committee to look at all of their recommendations that uh, they list promoting natural movement and have staff give us their present position on those ideas and and get feedback from council members as to whether those our present policies need to be changed or or we we're okay but uh, it's obvious that what we're doing is not in the best interest of the community in my mind as we're uh, they also mentioned you know we're in the for the last 10 years, we've been in the top 10 cities in pedestrian deaths, and, and things are continuing to get worse in that regard. So uh, I think that it's urgent in my mind that we begin making some changes. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Smith. Uh, Councilwoman Gray. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Well, I just want to bring to the attention of our community um, yesterday morning uh, was the the National Day of Prayer. And I just wanted to say how blessed I am to know that our city participates. We are the second largest group in the entire nation, um, with Washington, D.C. being the largest, that joined together as a city to pray over our country, over our businesses, over our government, our, our uh, schools, our churches. And it was just a, a great blessing to see a lot of the city staff there Yesterday morning, it was early, 6.30 a.m. I'm still recovering from that one. Um, but very grateful that we have the opportunity. And again, I want to give a shout out to our dear friend and past colleague, Jackie Sullivan, who took the time and investment along with others to make sure that we had this beautiful seal in, in our chambers that says, in God we trust. So with his leading, and our humility, I believe that our city can be in good hands. So God bless you all. Thank you, Councilwoman Gray. Councilwoman Core. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to give a shout out to my mom who's attending the city council meeting tonight. Um, my mom works at the US Postal Service and after a long day of work, she has made it out to two out of two of my city council meetings that I've had so far. So um, thank you, mom, for being here. And um, I also wanted to echo um, Council Member Smith's comments about the Blue Zones event. I mentioned it earlier today in a different context, but uh, it was coming from kind of like the urban planning world, it was very validating to hear a lot of the observations and um, you know just the conversations that have been had at this dais long before I've been here. Um, but to continue that work, and it, it feels good, it's very validating to hear another group of people kind of talking about the same things that I think we as a city feel are necessary improvements. And, um, you know, I'm really excited to see a, a tree canopy with, uh, what was it, 10,000 new trees in our city? Um, so I, I'm happy to help and hear more about that too. So that was a, a wonderful event that, um, I, I believe they have more workshops coming up. So uh, I, I think it would be very, uh, very nice to see some some of our other city council members there as well, and city staff and other folks from the community who um, you know take interest and in, uh, are particular about seeing those improvements in our city. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman Kaur, and welcome to Councilwoman Kaur's mother. Good to see you tonight. Um, I'd like to make a few comments if I can. Number one, I'd like to thank all of the city employees and community members who participated in this morning's homelessness point in time count. Uh, we started off at the mission at Kern County and fanned out throughout greater Bakersfield. Um, I had the opportunity to uh, participate myself and can tell you it was a visceral reminder of the pain and suffering that many of our community members are experiencing every single day on the streets of Bakersfield. Uh, this morning was very cold and to see so many people sleeping outside, um, unsheltered, uh, living in the elements, um, and hearing their stories as to how they found themselves homeless is just an urgent reminder 
for all of us in leadership uh, to build more housing and to identify new pathways for people to get out of the streets and into housing. And so I'm looking forward to the uh, work ahead of the um, Housing and Homelessness Committee um, and hoping that we will be able to accelerate lots of our efforts uh, in that regard. I also like to thank uh, city department heads and various different employees for attending the Old Town Current Community Meeting, which is very encouraging. We have many uh, business owners, property owners who have invested a significant amount of their own capital in Old Town Kern and have high hopes and big visions for that neighborhood. Uh, they look in inspiration towards downtown and they want to identify their own district. Um, and it was really, really um, powerful to have so many folks from City Hall there in Old Town Kern to talk one-on-one -on -one about the various different issues and also look towards opportunities to really revitalize Old Town Kern in the near future and also longer term. I wanna thank Public Works Department for their work on the traffic calming and feedback signs that they placed at Jefferson Park, or Jefferson, Jefferson School rather, and also on 24th Street. I'm uh, looking forward to the traffic calming handbook that will soon come to the full council uh, next month. And uh, finally, uh, council members, um, a few years ago, I had an opportunity uh, to attend the National Conference on Ending Homelessness. Uh, this was uh, shortly after um, the, the, the purchase of the Calcott facility. And on my own dime, went to Washington, D.C. and uh, participated in the conference with the singular goal of finding from all of the practitioners of homelessness services uh, throughout the country of who the best service provider for, uh, for uh, low barrier shelters was in, this, in the country. And to identify who they were and to bring them back to Bakersfield. What I heard, what I learned there, was that Mercy House was the top. They were the best. And so um, shortly after my return, made a, made a visit down to Orange County and uh, visited with Larry there uh, at Mercy House and their facilities and, and asked them to compete to, to receive the contract uh, to run the Brundage Lane Navigation Center. But that is an illustration of the power and value of attending some of these national conferences and convenings. And I believe that as we look towards our future as leaders of the ninth largest city, it is important for us to be at various different tables throughout the country where not only decisions are being made or big ideas are being discussed, but also important relationships can be fostered to better our city. Resolution 17306, that was adopted by the city council outlines the reimbursement for expenses for events such as conferences for city council members. The resolution includes an exhibit, exhibit A, and I encourage all of you to review exhibit A because this lists the limited number of events and conferences that are eligible for reimbursement for city council members, and it is limited. Um, the last time this policy was adopted, was updated was in 2016 over seven years ago. So I'd like to ask staff tonight to bring back a revision uh, for resolution 17306 that reflects modern best practices among like cities. Are there any other, other council comments at this time? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, next item. Adjournment. Thank you. Before we adjourn tonight, I'd like to ask that we take a moment of silence for the victims, victims of Monterey Park and Half Moon Bay incidents. Mayor Goh has sent texts and letters of condolences to both mayors on behalf of the city. May we all just take a moment of silence. Thank you. The meeting is adjourned at 626.